there's something that's very interesting about the fact that careers are very short and you have this really brief glimpse of incredible glory. I am officially retiring from the NFL and Green Bay Packers and uh, as much as I've thought about what I would say and um, how I promised I wouldn't get emotional. It's never easy. Dr. Mihai Tixet Mihai flow theory, and what we call out in the world, we call being in the zone. This is the reason why I came here is to uh, is to conduct research with him. Flow uh, turns out uh, after I've been studying it now for almost half a century, but is a quality of uh, experience that people report when they're completely involved in what they're doing. And it could be playing music, it could be playing chess, it could be playing sports. It's the feeling that one gets when one is doing the best at something that is difficult to do. There is a particular part of the brain that seems to be active in releasing dopamine when you are doing things like eating good food or having sex or listening to good music. And then there is another part of the brain that sends dopamine when you're doing something which requires effort and perseverance and output of energy. You become addicted to that sense of skill and power that you can have. And then when you no longer have the challenge anymore, you feel suddenly that you have fallen back. There are a lot of guys that, that would say, Maybe, maybe just to themselves. I just wish I'd have gone back for one or two more years. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the way I did it, there's, you know. But I, I can honestly say the way I did it, what for me was the right way. People say, what are you going to do when you retire? And I said, I don't know. I'll figure that out when I retire. I wanted to go find a hole and climb in it. Not much goes on around here. Farming and driving 18 wheelers. When I hear athletes talk about wanting to go into isolation and disappear, it's because they know that that identity has died. And it's almost like you don't want to face society based on who you were. It's like my shadow. And you're looking at my shadow, but I'm standing right here. But I don't know who this person is. Like, I go to the same high school he went to. There's a statue of him up on our football field. He's a hero in my eyes. Now, I kind of want to just be normal again. And it's, and it's been a lot better. Uh, I don't want to say it's been slow. I don't want to say it's been fast. But it's, it's, it's been about normal. I mean, it's, each and every day, I think, I'm not surprising people that I'm eating at a restaurant here, because initially, when I retired, I'd be eating, and someone said, what are you doing here? I'm like, man, I live here. Most people know that now. This is going to be a first. 
<laughs> yes, Liam's has been on the top left. It is. We'll go in your office, bud. Let's go in your. Let's go in your office. Oh. Bus, you need you stingy on that dang air conditioning. Yeah. So we video and everything. Just five, five first five days. So Miami takes the uh, the spot, the third spot in which they select pass rush specialists out of Oregon, Deion Jordan, three years ago, had played tight end, and has switched over to defensive end. Uh, great athlete. We'll, we'll see what happens. As an athlete, your entire identity from the time that you were a child through your adolescence into becoming an adult is entirely built upon the identity of the hero, the identity of the athlete. And it's reinforced by your family. It's reinforced by the community, the city, all the fans. Every Sunday we watched Brett play football. And when he was done, it was like, you know, what you gonna do now? Because it was so long. You have to be able to create space and pull away and make a choice so that your fans aren't deciding who you are now because that's who you were. You have to pull away to decide who am I going to be from here forth. And it takes time, especially for someone like a Brett Favre, someone that is a living legend. It was never about the money or fame or the records. It was never my accomplishments. It was our accomplishments. And the teammates that I played with, and I can name so many. It was never about me. It was about everybody else. I think the most unexpected kind of pain that any professional athlete, and especially a football player, uh, is likely to feel when they lose the game is the loss of connection to the other players, their organization, and then probably the fan base. You don't realize how much that's contributing to your well-being. Even though social pain almost seems like a metaphorical kind of pain, the brain doesn't seem to treat it as a metaphor at all. It treats it as a, a basic way that we uh, respond to the world. We've done a lot of work looking at the relationship between social pain and physical pain. We bring folks into the scanning facility and we tell them that they're going to control this little hand at the bottom of the screen here. And they believe they're playing a ball tossing game with two other folks who are also in scanners. Uh, and they're just playing this silly little game. And then after about a minute, the game changes. And what's important about the change here is that the other two players stop throwing the ball to the hand at the bottom of the screen. And that hand at the bottom of the screen, the real player never gets the ball thrown to them ever again. And so this is a way for us to introduce a rejection experience to people who are laying all alone inside an MRI scanner. And so then we're able to look at their brain while they're being left out of the game compared to when they were included in the game. And when we do this, we see two things that are fascinating. The first thing is that the brain regions that we know are central to registering the distress of physical pain, whether it's a stomach ache or arthritis or a broken leg, these regions are going to register that pain. And what we found is that very selectively, those same brain regions tend to become much more active when people were left out of the game compared to when they were included in the game. And so this suggests that the brain is responding in a way that's similar to social pain as it ordinarily would to physical pain. And the physical ailments are real, but I think that the kind of social pain that they might experience from being cut off uh, from these people that have uh, meant so much to them for so many years, I, I think that's probably gonna be one of the hardest and most unexpected kinds of distress they feel. Tiki Barber was the Giants' second-round pick and started his Giants' career primarily as a special teams player and a third-down back. 
After that great start as a rookie uh, in the NFL, I kind of went into a, a, a dive. So I said, you know what, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do if I don't make it as a player. So I started doing media. His role expanded in 2000 and then exploded in 2002. Coincidentally, my football career kind of took off right when I found this other path to walk. Rushing for more than 1,000 yards, five straight seasons, he finishes Giants' career as the team's all-time leading rusher. There is no slam dunk when it comes to success off the field if you want to go into the, on the media side of it or any other side. There have been players, I mean, I think their most recent guy that everyone said, oh, he's a lock. This guy, he's the most talented player to come out since the NFL basically has been invented. And that was Tiki Barber. And you were probably a little disappointed when star running back Tiki Barber announced he be, would be retiring from football. Well, guess what? The NFL's loss was our gain. That was one of the quickest crash and burn careers that I think we've seen and one of the most notable. Tiki Barber took to the Sunday Night Football studio mic on NBC and said Eli Manning's leadership in an offensive meeting last season was, quote, comical. I guess I was just happy for Tiki that he's making a smooth transition into the uh, media world. I stopped working on the sports side. I uh, was being used increasingly, increasingly less on the, on the NBC News side. I parted ways with NBC, and I was, I was doing nothing. I didn't know where I wanted to be. I didn't know who I was. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. As much as I anticipated and expected and planned, I mean, literally planned. I, I've, I planned out my life you know, more than anyone could, have, could even imagine. Uh, it, it didn't work. No, Tiki Barber never thought he'd be back here, rebuilding his body. But here he is, trying to do what no running back has ever done, come back to the NFL after four years away. There you go. There you go. So it's an anchor for you that you need right now? Absolutely it is. The game never needs you because there's always someone else to come take your place. But right now I need the game. What we can see in the brain is the neural basis of the pain response when we're being left out. We can also see the sort of pleasure and reward regions of the brain, not just when we're given a piece of chocolate to eat, which tastes great. We also see it light up when someone tells us that they like us. The brain's pleasure center goes crazy when it gets that kind of response. And being on a team means you're getting that in small ways every day. So, you know, football players maybe aren't always saying to each other, I love you, man, and, and that sort of thing. But there's various things, nonverbal cues and so on, that are activating that sort of positive motivational system every day. And that's taken away, almost like, you know, going off a drug. know it's depression but it, it was a depression you're out and and that's a hard place to be that was the transition mine was delayed and I was living in apartment to apartment to apartment sitting in the dark going to my mother's house and hiding in the attic so people just didn't know where I was the wealth that I generated as an athlete is just dissipating time can help but in that time, you gotta find your niche. Like time of just sitting at home and not trying to find something else to do, I don't know if that works. It's not that you're just not part of a team anymore. You've lost a major, major component of the meaning in your life. You might feel this pain and this distress, but not really know exactly what it is, not have the words for it. And that makes it all the harder. Meaning comes from being a part of something larger than yourself. I got a call from a friend of mine. He said, go meet my brother and you guys will figure out something. Uh, and eventually we came up with a business plan for the company that helps athletes post-career. If it wasn't for Chris Snee and David Deal and Sean O'Hara, you know, Eli Manning and, and 
Polesco Burris and Amani Tumor blocking downfield for me. I never would have had the seasons I had at the end of my career where, you know, at 31, I was rushing for 1,600 yards. It's the same thing with Fusio. If I hadn't found uh, Glenn Laumeister and Jared Jordan and Jared Augustine and then partnered with Martin Gerson, uh, who started a company as a serial entrepreneur, so he had all that expertise. If I hadn't had that team, I would have been out there doing it myself and throwing money away into the wind. That, that deck is new? That's new? Yeah. It's really about finding the right team. When you're playing, you have those incredible bonds, community, sense of belonging, friendship. There's many ways that you can bond with other people. I, yes, you'll never recreate that very special bond that you would have with your NFL teammates. Um, but there's other kinds of bonds that you can create you know, later on in life. There are really three pillars that research supports are the most important to happiness. So one is connecting to others, two, personal growth, three, contributing to society, to your community. You're playing, you have those friendships, that sense of belonging, community. Now, when that ends, you can sort of remake those pillars again, rebuild them again, focusing on those friendships, on family, giving back to the community, and somehow helping others. I was rewarded throughout my career. You know, I, I feel like I can I can give something back. Lars Swain on the ground. Coming into the Hattiesburg. All right, you're going to go forward. Pass that ambulance. Ma'am, I need to go. I need to go. Mississippi is still picking up the pieces after a tornado ripped through the city more than a week ago. Brett Favre, of course, a longtime resident of the area who's taken an active role in the rebuilding effort. We're pleased to be joined by the future Hall of Famer. And as we say hello to Brett, Brett, that's a powerful image behind you. How are you doing this morning? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing OK, doing better. Um, yay. Um, a lot of rubble, but we'll we'll clean up. There was a television interview that I watched, and you could just see the pain in his face. You know, he, he is truly connected to Hattiesburg, to the community. You know, Brett's an icon here. And I think these people around here take care of him, protect him. He just has to give back. I mean, that's, that's just the kind of person he is. He's a, such a great guy, you know, and he's just, just one, of, one of us, and yet, He's so much more than us, and, but he makes us feel better because we're around him and because he's with us here. You know, you find out a lot about people in times like this, and it does galvanize uh, r really the whole community and city. I do studies where we ask people to do three or five acts of kindness every week. So tomorrow, do go out and do three acts of kindness, anything. Do something nice for someone else. And that has so many benefits. You're not sort of ruminating about how unhappy you are, but you're helping someone else. And I think that's one of the kind of magic pills for unhappiness, is to go out and help someone else. Evolutionary theory suggests that helping others is biologically wired, because that's how we survive. Uh, we wouldn't have survived lots of adversities as human beings without helping each other. But as you might think, even with his head bouncing off the ground, Wayne Crevet holds on to yeah. the football. One of the truly popular football heroes in the great metropolitan New York area, Wayne Crevet. I always said he'd have to carry me off the field for me to retire. And that happened. How long would I have played? I don't know. What was I going to play until I wasn't good enough, or I got replaced by a young guy, or you know, I got released. You know, maybe, maybe that was the 
appropriate way to go out the way uh, the way I played. You know, didn't want to, but it happened. Well, he never went back. They just packed up his stuff and sent it to him. It was just easier to have them send it. To have to go back and take your stuff out, that would have just, that would have been awful. I don't even think he opened it for a long time. It was so heartbreaking to not be part of the team anymore. They diagnosed me with post-concussion syndrome. You read scary stuff about life expectancy and, you know, athletes 20% more likely to get dementia and all that stuff. Whatever the doctor was that we saw in college was aware that he'd had too many mm -hmm. and that it was dangerous. And the doctor said, if you get one more, you can't play anymore. And he told the doctor, if you tell anyone that, I will kill you. <laughs> and so it was never told to anyone, and he just kept playing. <laughs> Mostly like forever. Yeah. <laughs> and they came out and like, oh, we're done. No, no, done. Okay, guys. Yeah. You retire and it's there's nothing. Nobody's planning your day for you. You don't have an itinerary. You don't have a schedule. You don't have practice. And you have to figure it out for yourself. So I think a lot of people get depressed because of that. And you know, and on top of that, there can be other issues. You know, people can have financial problems. You, you know, and there can be marital problems. And add some brain injury to the mix, and it could be scary. It probably wasn't the easiest to deal with at the end of my career, you know, not being myself. You know, my wife hung in there through it all. I mean, she, she went through, you know, hell. I mean, the divorce rate for retired players within three years is like 75%. You have to hope that you're strong enough to overcome whatever it is that comes. What advice would you give to uh, another player's wife? I would just say it's going to get really hard and just, like, oh, just hold on. Just wait. Just wait. Give it a couple of years and don't give up on it. <laughs> There's data that follows people and asks them once a year, how happy are you? before and after major life events. I'll give you some examples. After divorce, it takes an average of about four or five years for people to get back to their previous level of happiness. For the death of a spouse, it's five, six years. For mild disability, it's shorter. I think it's something like one or two years. So it really depends. And so, and no one's done a study of, you know, retired NFL players. But people are so resilient. Now, they have to act, so they shouldn't just sort of sit around and wait to get happier. One day, just, you know, give myself a gut check and said, uh, you know, I got to do something. Motivate myself to, uh, to find something. I always had an interest in the uh, stock market and finance. And I met a friend who was in the business, and we spoke, and we thought that we could be a great team. I hadn't been in school in uh, however long. I hadn't studied anything except the playbook. So it took a while, you know, like half a year just to, to pass the test that I needed to. Um, but I did. Still don't know how I did. If I took the test right now, I'd fail miserably. But uh, I guess I peaked on the right day. And it's a really hard test. He had an essential accomplishment when he passed that. And things really started to, to, to pick up and be happier. Yeah. You're a superstar? Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. 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 Uh -oh. Getting married and having three boys. That's my four Super Bowls. <gasps> I got hired at Morgan Stanley. I was there four years and just moved to Barclays and in the city. Now I'm in the middle of New York City in the 
and I love it. The good thing about my job is that, you know, I lead a team, I'm part of a team. And it's not, I'm not an individual, so it's nice to go to work and have a team of seven people, you know, to feel that bond again, that's great. There's research on what's called post-traumatic growth. After a trauma, you're trying to adapt, you're trying to cope. Um, and if there's a graph, it would be basically you'd kind of go, you, you're kind of here, and then you go down. Okay, and then you slowly go back up, and post-traumatic growth is you end up even higher than you started. He's, he's, he's home. I mean, you could sit in a restaurant and Brett Favre come over and talk to you. He's, he's not, he's just, he's just people. He, he's a, a, a coach out at a, a high school in Oak Grove. Not a head coach, but he, he's been helping them. When Reggie White retired, and I would say, you miss it, Reggie? And he'd say, you know, you know what I miss? I miss the guys. That's all he talked about. He never talked about one more sack. Or, and that was kind of shocking to me. But I feel the same way. And I ended up coaching a year removed. And it's kept me close to the game. I enjoy it. They don't pay me a dime. It gives me that, that unity. Different, but it does give me a... Uh, a sense of belonging and uh, that team. I'm much happier than I thought I would be. I'm sure some people probably thought I'd lead us to the state championship last year, but um, I actually thought I would. So that was disappointing that I didn't, but at the end of the year, I felt really good about what I had done. The fact that I had finished a year as a, a high school football coach, not that far removed from, from playing the, the biggest stage of them all. And I was okay with it. I didn't feel like, you know, where's all the cameras at? Or where's all the people at? It didn't bother me. I mean, I was okay just being a high school football coach. Teams are essential, and one of the things that make us different from all the other animals in the animal kingdom, the way we can work in larger teams together, it allows us to do something as a group that we would never be able to do on our own. Sports are one of the ways we connect with each other. When my son was three years old, I think three or four, I was watching a hockey game. Um, he never seen a hockey game. Um, he kept asking, who are the guys in the red shirt? And I said, oh, that's uh, New York Rangers. Who are in the blue shirts? And I said, that's Boston. Uh, he said, what is closest to us? And I said, I think New York is uh, 100 miles closer than Boston. And he said, oh, then I'm for the red guys. You know, um, and from then on, the whole game became something more purposeful. He wanted the, the ones who were closer to us. I want them to win. <laughs> it's kind of been bred into us to, to pick a team, commit to that team, or pick a sport, commit to that sport. It's hardwired to have a sense of belonging, to be part of a team, a group. It makes us feel very, very good. You can experience flow. You can get into the zone and all kinds of activities. People say that athletes die twice. They die when their career ends, and then they die when they, you know, they die. But I also like to say that athletes, but anyone, we're also born twice. We're born when we're born, but we're also born when we actually know why we were born, when we fully realize the purpose of our life.
We're joined now by NFL Hall of Famer Michael Strahan of my personal favorite football team and a man who's given me a tremendous amount of personal happiness, the New York Giants. One of the world's leading experts in the field of positive psychology, Sean Acor, and my good friend and a man that I had the privilege of working with, helping him bring his story to the big screen, former Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming and agreeing to participate in this. Thank you for having us. My grandma was the most nervous human being that ever lived. And she was al always had a cigarette in one hand and a glass of scotch in the other. And all she ever did, she'd walk into the room and she'd say, oh my God, I was so worried. And she was just always stressed and always worried. And one day I said to her, Grandma, are you ever happy? And she looked at me and she said, happy, that's a big word. And my grandma and her struggles with happiness were something that I always connected. And I guess, Sean, I wanted to start with you as kind of our in-house expert on happiness. So I guess my first question to you is what I asked to my grandma, you know, you know what, what, is, what is happiness? I think happiness um, is not just pleasure. I think oftentimes when people think about happiness, they normally think about, you know, if I open a certain soda or if I win a race, I'll be happy. And I think, I think if that's our definition of happiness, then it's very short-lived. Um, what I'd really love for people to do is to start redefining what happiness looks like in the first place. Um, going back to the ancient Greeks, and they define happiness as the joy that we feel growing towards our potential. And I love that definition because it's not about it's not about just momentary pleasure. It's about something you can feel even in the ups and downs. Joy is something you can experience even when you're going on tough runs, or even when you're practicing hard, or even when you're injured, or even when you're in the midst of a childbirth, right? You can have joy in the midst of pleasurable moments and unpleasurable moments. So happiness for me is something that's ongoing. So I feel like I'm working on happiness, but it, it's something that you, you move towards. Not so that's like you're, you're sort of talking about the journey versus the destination, that, that we find happiness along the way rather than in any specific accomplishment or a moment. I think we have to because as soon as we hit a success, our brain changes what success looks like almost immediately. So if happiness is on the opposite side of success, none of us ever get there, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's always off in the future. Uh, what I, wa I wa want people to realize, and uh, I think this is part of your, your stories, is that happiness is about joy that you experience when you've got deep social connection. Happiness is about feeling like your behavior matters. Happiness is about seeing life as not a threat, but as a challenge. So, Michael and Marcus, I know both of you guys pretty well. You know, you've experienced highs. I'm wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about what that high feels like and what it then feels like when you uh, retire or when you can no longer serve. It isn't about the destination, it's about the ride kind of a deal. And when I was chasing that my entire life, it was, there was, they always tell us not to look at the end of the tunnel because it, it's over just like that. You never know. I, I mean, just a split second, it's over. So don't anticipate the ending. I mean, you watch people die left and right, people quit, break, whatever it is, and then the, the guys who are still there, there's a bond that's formed that's, that's absolutely unbreakable. There's just some bond that is built just from going through the process of everything. And I, and I think for, for me, it is not, it, there's nothing that I can do that replaces football. Nothing I can do that replaces sacking a the quarterback. There's nothing I can do that replaces walking out in front of 80,000 people who are screaming and just, just all of that. But I don't miss that. I miss the guys. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the, the hardest challenge is to go from a life that is, um, in, in a, it, that's, as Sean would attest, that's so structured. Yeah. You know, our lives are so structured as a football player. And in the military, you're told where to be, what time to be there, and you kind of, everything is set up, you just get there and you do it. I didn't anticipate getting out or the future and marriage and kids. Now, that wasn't on my, even on my radar. Mm -hmm. It was all about the, the ride, that adrenaline rush, that it's a drug that you can't yeah. imagine. You know, can't it's like su su suiting up and just getting ready to go out. And I don't know if it's going to go down like I think it is, but I'm, I'm, I'm all about it, you know. And then um, sure, when it's over, when they take us away from that, I, I think that's one of the biggest I mean, I, that, that was my deal. I, I tried to figure out what it was, and I, I never had any problems with the, the mental aspect of it, and it took me a little bit to figure out what was going on. I realized the problem actually when I went back to my teammates, mm -hmm. and then M Melanie, my wife, was with me, and she goes, I don't even, I don't even recognize you. Who, who? I mean, I was bouncing off the walls, and there's that hole that's, that's created when they separate us from our teammates, yeah. and it, it, it can never be filled. 
until you get back around. And we, we, we find, obviously, as we grow older and I'm married with kids now and I, I have a new focus and, that, and that's, that's my happiness. As I'm, but there's always that part of me that, because that's what we are. Yeah. You can separate us from it, but that's, it's ingrained in our, DNA, in our DNA. And no matter how hard you try, no matter what we focus on, everything else, there's that, there's that, that empty hole that can only be filled when you're around it. And that's, we were talking earlier, that's why you reach out and kind of touch the things that, that revolve around what we used to do. How hard was that adjustment for you guys when you first retired? I'm talking about really like the initial days of really realizing, I was probably right after that. I mean, you wake up and you go, you wake up and it, it, it's not like, the thing is, it was an off season after, you know, I retired during the off season, but you know, you're still going through it going, okay, July, your body starts feeling. You know, I'm supposed to be doing something. I'm supposed yeah. to be doing something. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And when what you're so used to doing is it there for you to do anymore, you're looking around like, um, basically probably looking at your wife going, you want to play football? I, mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that my, uh, my community, the guys in my community, and I, I think with football players too sometimes, and athletes overall, is they, even though they break us out of that routine that we're in, the foot, playing the games and everything like that, every, some guys just stop everything all together. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I still get up in the morning and, and, and PT like I did. I, that shouldn't change. I mean, I need to take care of my body. I, just because I'm not in the teams anymore doesn't mean it's going to take care of itself kind of a deal. I mean, they found that exercise is the equivalent of taking an antidepressant for the first six months, but for the next two years afterwards, you have up to a 30% lower relapse rate going back to being depressed. And part of the reason for that is this idea that every time you, you exercise, you, you've been successful. You record a victory in your brain and it cascades to the next activity. Like if I've been successful there, I wanna do it somewhere else. I wanna do it somewhere else. And we find that people who exercise in the morning are better at dealing with their inbox at two o'clock in the middle of the day, that there's this cascade of success that they experience in their life. But what, what I find so amazing about what you're both describing is that this, this high, this, this moment of potential is in the midst of so much stress. I kind of like the stress. I did, that was a drug for yeah. us. Yeah, I, just, I like the stress. When the pain is fuel kind of a deal for us, and the, the more it hurts, the more you push, and I keep referring back to the whole team environment, not that I can't handle anything on my own, but I'm just saying it makes it a lot easier when you got somebody there suffering with you, and then the victory is, is sweeter when, when it's over as well. And that was the one challenge mm -hmm. that I loved the most with trying to get, as a leader, 53 guys on that field on a Sunday to all believe that you always got a chance to win, mm. that, you know, this practice we're putting in during the week, it will lead to that, and try to get everybody on the same page. Similar, right? Sure, and I, I mean, that also has a lot yeah. to do with an experience and youth, because you know as well as I do, when the young guys get hit hard and they go down, it's, man, I don't think we're beat. Yep. And then mm. the guys who have been around and been in that struggle are like, well, you know, we're down, we ain't beat. We're not done. And uh, sure, to rally all those guys around, absolutely. Absolutely. That's... But I miss the stress. Yeah. No, that's... But so once the game stops, and now you're dealing with all the stressors we're dealing with, you know, mm -hmm. age, motivation, purpose, is it a transition? It's hitting a brick wall at 100 miles an hour. That's what it's like coming out of something like that. I mean, we're talking about being in gunfights and enjoying it. I asked everything I, everything I ever wanted to, uh, that I got, all of my injury, everything I wanted. I wanted to be in the worst situation, and I, all the guys in my community, that's why we're in our community together, and they separate us from everybody else, because we're, sure, there's probably something a little twisted about us, but <laughs> you gotta have guys like us on the line, that's just the way it is. Yeah, and, if, and I kind of look at it like the injuries are like a badge. It's like a badge of honor. Can I see that? I remember you showing me that one. Oh, that one's done like that. Yeah, that. Well, the old times, well, well, the guys who come way. ahead of us tell us that. They're like, you're gonna be jacked up. But don't you look and, and you're you like, go, uh, you, oh, don't you, you don't know what you're talking. It's either right. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm in here. I'm young, and let's get it on. And then, knee, shoulders, back, what concussions, whatever it is. And, yep. and like, hey, man, that juice was worth the squeeze. I wouldn't change it. Difficult when you have these high moments you guys are describing. That if you compare a moment to that, it's going to lose, right? And that's what we find in this research too. Is that like just like you know, if somebody owns. You know, if they put all their money into one stock, if that stock's doing well, they're doing great. They're happy, but as soon as that stock doesn't do well, suddenly their whole system's fragile. And what, what I'd love to see more people do is find that, like diversify their, their meaning portfolio, if you want to put it that way. Diversify the amount of places in their life that they find meaning, that they're finding meaning in their family, they're finding meaning in you know, exercise for themselves or meaning in a team or meaning in, you know, learning something when you're reading a book or, you know, watching, watching a show, like finding ways of, uh, of 
making it so that you have so much meaning in your life so that one, when one area is not working out, you've got these others that are there in place uh, to help you out. You were talking about how result-oriented we all are now, and, you know, oh, we're all dads here. Is there a way to start teaching our kids a different way of thinking about success so that it is more journey-oriented? I think we should, but uh, part of the reason I was so excited to talk to you guys <clears throat> is I want to find out how we do this because... Um, so I spent, I spent 12 years at Harvard, which, you know, I'd see these kids that work so hard in high school, they felt like, you know, if I got to Harvard, then I'd be happy. Like, they worked so hard to achieve. <laughs> they get there, 80% of them experience depression. 10% of them contemplate suicide over the, the previous year. So what we're finding is that, like, having that success doesn't work, so then, oh, well, it must be once I'm out a banker or a lawyer or a doctor. And it keeps getting pushed off, and what we find is they're never taught how to create happiness in the first place. But they've been successful. So on the one hand, you want people to push to be successful in sports. You want people to not be complacent. You know, like I, Live to work, work to live kind of a deal. Yeah, I'm wondering how, how we teach, because all the research I do says that there's something called the happiness advantage, which is when your brain feels joy in the present, every success outcome improves. But some people wait for the sale, or they wait till they win the game, or they wait until you know they've had some sort of experience, and they miss out on what their brain is capable of. I think you have to learn how to accept the part of the journey. Now, because when, when I play, I play 15 years. And after year 13, I look back and said, you know, I never, I, I, I played well. I never really enjoyed this, so, truly. Yeah. I mean, I was very successful at it, but I can't say in my heart mm -hmm. that I thought that I really loved it and enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And then for, I just changed my mindset to say, you know what? One day I'll never put on these pads again. I'll never lace these shoes. My knee could go out today. So I'm going to practice as hard as I can. I'm going to go and smile every right, day. Right. I'm going to enjoy every second of it. Why weren't you there that way earlier? Why I was so focused on, on winning and losing. Not it wasn't about the journey, it was about at the end of the day, did I feel like I won, did I feel like I put my best, best work that I could put out there. And that was always my mindset. But I had to learn how to curtail that mindset to be one of, okay, I'm still going to get the job done, yeah. but I'm going to enjoy getting the job done. And I'm going to remember the experience of getting the job done instead of remembering only the one thing that I win or lose. Do you remember when that shift, like, was it a... When I was miserable, was like a light thinking switch? that I was thinking I was done playing because not because physically I couldn't do it, but mentally I was just tired of doing something <clears throat> that I felt, even though I was successful at it, I just wasn't enjoying it because what was the joy in <clears throat> doing something and knocking your head against the wall and not winning at the end of it all because all I value was winning and losing. I did, wasn't in valuing the relationships yeah. and the journey of it. You two guys who've come through pretty remarkable careers and had, had experienced the big drop, you know, you've been unplugged. If you guys now see 29, 30-year-old guy who's just gotten out who's not doing what you're doing, or you, you know, obviously see someone that's just gotten out, what are your thoughts generally on making that transition? I mean, make it through the shock. Yeah. That's, hold on. I mean, you'll get, I mean, it, that part goes away, and then after that. I think it's frustration because you don't know how to channel that energy. You don't, mm. you don't know what you're good at because the only thing you really felt good at is gone. So you got to find you, figure, right? You gotta, yeah, you got to figure that out. Then I think that's what most guys feel, that what else can I do? But hopefully now guys will start to understand People are smart and people are talented in more than one way. And you can find happiness, you know, in your personal life just as much as you can find in your business life in so many different ways to be happy. And I've found that some strange way in my own roundabout way. I think one of the things that you're both describing is that the joy is what caused you to be so good at what you were doing. And if we could get coaches that are watching this, parents that are watching this, to see that, you know, it's not about, like, once you get to some place, then you're going to be happier. But if we can instill this idea that if we could create greater levels of happiness now in the present, if they can find that joy now, they're going to be closer to their potential. Will you talk about the the fundamental tenets that you might say to a, whether it's a 30-year-old retiring NFL player, a 30-year-old SEAL that just got out, or, you know, someone that's going through a divorce or the, you know, death of a loved one, a a anything. I think happiness is not something that just happens to you. I think it's something we actually have to work for. Otherwise, you're just your genes and your environment. 
happiness is a harder choice for some people than it is for other people. But what I love about this research is what we're finding is you can actually deviate both from your genes and your environment to create a different life. And, and you've even experienced that, that, that sense of I was unhappy at one point, but now I'm happier. It's not just your genes. We found simple things like just like we train you know, a soldier to look for potential threats within a situation very quickly, we can train the opposite. We can do it with four-year-olds where you have them uh, think of three things that they're grateful for that are new that happened over the past 24 hours. Seems simple, but what their brain is actually training, it's training to scan their environment for the things that actually cause them to feel more grateful. And what we find is we can move somebody from a low-level pessimist to a low-level optimist within a period of 21 days. Six months later, we can get them to low to moderate-level optimist, that their default changes. And we can do that you know, on a sports team, you can do that with an 84-year-old man, right? Um, but you can do other things. We know exercise matters. We know two minutes of meditation, just taking your hands off of your keyboards or your phones and, you know, just watching your breath going out seems simple. Raised our accuracy rates by 10%. So how, how does somebody do that? How do people that are sitting here watching, what, how do you do two minutes of meditation? How do you even begin to do that? I'd make it really simple. I'd say go from multitasking for a minute to just trying to do one thing at a time. So for me, it's just watching my breath going in and out. For two minutes, that's about all I can do. And that help you better than to just take a deep breath. Yeah, you know, step back. Is that something breath. you guys train, learn, talk about when you're in the team? I've been doing that my whole life, mm -hmm. martial arts from the very beginning and everything. But yeah, I mean, you'd see, when they, well, there's multiple phrases for it: taking a wrap off, you know, step step off uh, offline, kind of a deal, and just collect okay. yourselves, collect yourself. And and he, I, I agree 100 percent with what he was saying. I mean, if if I wasn't born a natural athlete. I wasn't big. I wasn't yeah. the smartest, fastest. I mean, I, I saw something that I wanted, and I was willing to do what it took to get it. Mm. And if you're, I mean, you, if, you're, if you're born, you can pick yourself up and take a breath and have a conscious thought. You can do anything you want. Mm. I don't care if man, woman, what color you are, what religion, that doesn't mean anything. It's all, it, nobody has any idea what's in here. Mm -hmm. You can't stop that fire, or you got to kill me to stop me kind of a deal. That's the mentality we have, and that's why we... I mean, I just won't accept, I won't accept that. Um, so, so. But you're right, it's not, I always found whether not only the biggest, strongest, fastest is the one who, who wanted it. Yeah. Who wants it more. Do you still feel that, in, obviously in a different way, you're not allowed to go around sacking people and, and you can't shoot people anymore, but is that competitive fire still there? Is it still... Is if it fighting? has to be in certain ways, sure. but for the most part, I don't go through every day looking, going, oh, man, I got to get that guy, or oh, I got to be number one at this But something's that. getting you up in the morning. And I think what it taught us is how far right. we could push ourselves before yeah. we broke. And I, most people don't know how what the human body is capable of and the mind. And we keep kids from failing so much they never learn that, right? Like what yeah. you guys... Oh, my kids don't know how to have that problem. Well, that's good, yeah. right? <laughs> we need more of it because we've got these helicopter parents who, like, <clears throat> you know, make sure the kid's not going to fail. Like, they're going to do their paper for them just so they don't fail. They'll yeah. finish their science fair project. So they never, ever learn what they're... Like, we get the kids at Harvard who break that first year, you know, they had all these great grades and they just shatter the first time they get a, a C or a B or a, heaven forbid an F on a, on a test because they've never learned how to overcome a challenge. A, a challenge in the past. And I think that's, that's one of the things we could be teaching people earlier on is that like the, the, the failure isn't, isn't bad at all. That's what actually teaches you where those limits are, you know, and when you overcome oh, them. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you don't have any idea how good you can be until you've been beat mm -hmm. and what, when you pick yourself up from that. I remember the thing that I'm proudest of were when you're on the field, you know the game's over. Your team's getting their butts whipped. The other team's just going to run the ball down your throat because he's running the clock out. And the coach is like, come on, Michael, come out the game. You don't need to get hurt. And I said, absolutely not. Yeah. I helped us get in this hole. I'm going to be out here to the end because if I come off to these guys, they're not going to respect me. Mm -hmm. There's no stars. There's... You, none of that. It's a foot, you're a football player at that moment. You're not better than your team. You're part of that community. Part of, you're that, part of that community. And isn't that the, the final thing that you talk yeah. about is community, right? That exactly what you're talking about. I, it's my favorite subject, and it, you both talked about it. Like, it's the thing that you miss most, right? It's the, that community bond that you can feel. Um, the question is how you replicate it, and you can't, right? You can't yeah. replicate what you guys have experienced. But what we should do is we we got to teach kids, we got to teach ourselves, we got to teach society how to create some social bonds better, right? But my question is, how do you talk about how do you talk about something like happiness at boot camp or in buds? How do you? Well, that's you not. There's a time and place for that. I mean, you're, you're, you're that doesn't belong there. Yeah, that's not why you're there. So where where does it belong? 
where, where should they be teaching it? And not just in this, also, where do you teach happiness in sports? Like, how do you teach people early on that's not about the win, it's about what you were describing earlier? Yeah, maybe enjoying the journey, enjoying every day, enjoying the... Pr I think if what I realized when I enjoyed the journey and I enjoyed... I focus more in practice. Every drill was important. Every step I took, where my hands were placed, I took pride in trying to be what I needed, the, the best that I could be. And I think if you can teach happiness and enjoyment of every step, it leads to that. And at the end of the day, if you have enough guys who believe in that, you will be successful. You will win. I do agree with that. And I think if you define happiness right, happiness becomes the greatest competitive advantage on a team. It becomes that joy that causes you to actually hit that potential. But it's got to not be happiness that's just like a smile on your face or pleasure. Because I used to think I had to be angry to play every game. When I was young, Yeah. he talked about my mama. And the dude don't even know the dude. He don't know my mom. <laughs> but I had to get, get it in my oh, head right, right. to try to get angry. Yeah. But as I got older... I didn't have to, I, I could talk to, we have this discussion on the sideline, I'd be sitting on the bench, we'll have this right, discussion, right. they'll say defense, i say, hold on, I'll be right back. Yeah. Grab my helmet. Yeah. Once I put my helmet on, I'll just yeah, switch, yeah, yeah. boop. Yeah. Go do what I gotta do, come back, sit down, and pick up the conversation yeah. where we left off. Time to go to work, I'll be right yeah. back. Yeah. I'll be right back. That, to me, starts getting into the realm of becoming a master and really understanding an experience like football or like combat. And you're no longer the young rookie that's full of misguided ideas. Sure, we're lucky. We, we not only made a pretty good career, we're, <coughs> we're fortunate afterwards, too. Yeah. And, um, but, I mean, you don't have to be a, a, a Navy we weren't. He wasn't born a professional athlete. I wasn't born a Navy SEAL. If you're watching this and you, and you, you think that just like, oh, I can't. Man, I, retiring at 30, I, we had a guy in my buzz class, 32. Mm. I had one of my officers, he's, he's not with us anymore, but he, he was, hey, I, I said something to him about going to medical school after I got out of the military. And I was like, ah, I think I, I might be too old. He goes, the minute you think you're too old to do anything, start digging a hole. You think, you know, God will let you know when you're too old, because you'll be done, kind of a deal. Never too old to do anything, man. Just start it Fin and keep going. And if it, if it ain't meant to be, it's not to be. Stay in the game. Thank you, guys. Michael, thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Marcus. Well, Sean, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for watching. Stay to play from Los Angeles tonight. Good night.